Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Seeds and Weeds podcast brought to you by Small House Farm. Join us as we talk with gardeners, foragers, herbalists, chefs, and community activists to explore the many ways that plants impact our cultures and cuisines, our history, and our future. I'm your host, Bevan Cohen, and this is Seeds and Weeds. Welcome back, my friends. You know, spring is springing here at Small House Farm, and we have got a fantastic episode lined up for you today. We're going to be chatting with author and forager George Barnett. Now, we're going to be discussing his new book, and George is going to be telling us all about the many wonderful and wild edibles that we could be foraging this time of year. I was just recently invited to join Kate Archer Kent on Wisconsin Public Radio's morning show to talk about seeds and seed libraries, but we also had a chance to talk about the tomato collection of the late Thane Earl. Now, Thane was a Wisconsin seed saver that's probably most well-known for introducing the world to the Amish paste tomato, which just happens to be one of my favorite Canon tomatoes of all time. It was really fun digging into the story. So, of course, as usual, the link to that program, it'll be down in the show notes if you want to check it out. And if you want to know more about the background and history of the Amish paste tomato, I've posted a story that I researched over in our Patreon group. This is a piece I'd originally written for the Baker Creek Seed Catalog, but now it's over on the Patreon, too, so everybody can check it out. Speaking of Patreon, I want to say thank you and welcome to our newest members, Angela Riley, Karen Bird, Carrie, and Christine Stalsenberg. Thank you all so much to all of our new and returning Patreon members. Of course, it's your support that helps keep the podcast on the air. We now have more than 150 members in our Patreon community, and that, it's just amazing. It's awesome. If you want to learn more about supporting the podcast, joining our community, and the many benefits that the members enjoy, you can head on over to seedsandweedspodcast.com or find that link down in the show notes. Today's episode of Seeds and Weeds is also brought to you in part by our friends at Garden Joy, the garden game that lets you explore your love for plants, seasons, horticulture, and outdoor design. I downloaded this app the other day, and I gotta tell you, this game, it's super fun. You can find it right in your app store. You can download it for free. Not only do you get to play around, design your own, you know, virtual gardens, but you also get to learn about the different plants along the way. They're Latin names, growing tips, all sorts of cool stuff. And here's the kicker. The folks at Garden Joy have teamed up with an organization called One Tree Planted to help them reach their goal of one million trees planted this year. So by playing this game, you can also support the cause and help get these trees planted. I'm going to be playing the game over the next few weeks, and I'll keep you updated on my progress. So that's Garden Joy. It's a fun gardening game that you can find over in your app store and download it today. Now let's get on to that interview. George Barnett owns and operates The Hungry Forager, an educational program based in the Bluegrass region focused on teaching people all about wild edibles. His educational background includes restoration ecology, foraging, and the history of utilizing tree crops in North America. He lives in Louisville, Kentucky with his partner and their two children. And today, George is joining us on the podcast to talk about foraging wild edibles and his brand new book, Foraging Kentucky. George Barnett, welcome to the podcast, my friend. We are super excited to have you with us here today. Thanks so much, Bev. I'm happy to be here. Now, you got a new book out. It's called Forager. Origin Kentucky just came out April 2nd. And by the way, it's a gorgeous book. I love it, man. But before we get into that, uh, you're the founder of The Hungry Forager. So could you tell us just a little bit more about what The Hungry Forager is and your background as an educator and a forager of wild foods? Yeah. So The Hungry Forager is uh, really just an outdoor educational uh, program. I started in 2020. Uh, Effectively, it's just like plant and mushroom walks uh, with also added natural history and ecology components to it and education around uh, restorative ecology, native plants and ethnobotany. So that's kind of what the what uh, the Hungry Forger has become. Um, it's kind of metaphor uh, m- metamorphosized a little bit over the years um, just to kind of meet my interests because I just really enjoy teaching things that I'm really passionate about. And when it comes to how I found myself kind of in this world of gathering wild edibles and doing the research on wild edibles, I really just came about naturally just through being out in the woods, uh, spent a lot of time backpacking in my late teenage years, early 20s, uh, had my first child around that time around I was 19. And all of that uh, kind of took place. And I was just out in the woods a lot out in urban parks. And I was interested in what plants were growing around me. And then kind of one thing led to another. And I started getting field guides, um, botany uh, books, mushroom books, and really the rest has kind of been history. So yeah, it's been, it's been a lot of fun and I've had a lot of, uh, a lot of great experiences with the Hungry Forager and going out with, you know, at this point, probably over a thousand people that have just like-minded interests and people that are new to foraging, people that have been doing it for decades. So it's been a lot of fun. Oh, it's pretty cool. I saw on the Hungry Forager website, you also offer um, some virtual foraging workshops. Yeah. So that was something I actually started 
uh, over the winter of 23 uh, to be able to kind of like offer throughout the spring because there's like a lull. So, you know, I don't typically offer workshops usually after November until about mid to late March. This top, this year, actually, it's not even until April because, uh, you know, now, you know, the Hungry Forager has always just been a component of my life since it started. I am soon to have three kids. I currently have two. I try to offer as much of myself as I can to that community that it's kind of became over the past four years. Um, and so with those virtual workshops, those are actually kind of like pre-recorded workshops. And so what I'll do is I'll prepare a particular topic, make slides for it and do a presentation. And that's what is available through the website. And I've offered virtual workshops in the past. People like being able to go at their own pace more as far as some of the knowledge and information that we're diving into, because some of the stuff like, you know, gathering tree crops or processing wild foods, it can be a lot to kind of, you know, cram into an hour and have everybody really digest that. So I like to be able to provide them a recording to refer back to, you know, for indefinite purposes if needed. Oh, sure. Now, are these online workshops, are they geared more specifically to folks in Kentucky or are they something that's valuable to students outside the area, too, that are looking to learn more about foraging and things? I would say that really anything that I discuss in those virtual workshops absolutely uh, applies to anyone in the southeast region and even, you know, upwards towards the southern edge of the northeast. So, yeah, there's definitely a lot of uh, knowledge that translates out of the state of Kentucky. But of course, you know, being based here. It's the most relevant here, but the Southeast is certainly uh, appropriate for the knowledge. And then and the same goes for the book. That's why, you know, the, the subtitle is an introduction to the edible plants, fungi and tree crops of the Southeast, because it also does, you know, have a lot of translation for uh, all the species that I cover in the book. Uh, they can be found in, in most of the Southeastern states. Now, you kind of touched on this, but I'd like to hear a little bit more, uh, maybe some stories about your earlier experiences with forage. How long have you really been doing it? And how did you get started? What are some of the first plants that you found yourself enjoying out there? Yeah, I would probably say, uh, I mean, I, I won't necessarily utilize the childhood memories because those were kind of just more subconscious on the spur of the moment happenings with stuff like blackberry and mulberries. Uh, but they were important in the sense that they kind of were precursors to what I eventually would find as a young adult, late teen. Um, and at that time, uh, what, had, what had really kind of sealed my interests in foraging were things like low bush blue blueberry, uh, acorns, processing acorns into flour to be able to make things like pancakes, just fun stuff like that, where I actually had to do a little bit of processing, which had me be more physically and intellectually involved with the research and the steps to do these things. And then, of course, uh, medicinal mushrooms were a huge component to that as well. Learning some of those real common species like turkey tail that can be found through all, you know, throughout the entire country. Those are just, you know, ubiquitous all over. And when I read that those could actually be uh, steeped or simmered in water for, you know, 30, 60 minutes and that you could get some type of medicinal extract from that to consume. I was just so fascinated uh, with those possibilities and kind of was able to see the landscape that I was inhabiting, you know, all this time in an entirely different way. I love what you said about the acorns, you know, because there's something to be said about the process from, you know, a nut on the forest floor all the way through to a pancake. How involved that is, as, as opposed to, you know, just picking berries and eating them. I mean, that really, I think, helps solidify the experience to make it something so special, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And I mean, and just even like the it, when you get down to just the handling, you know, the time that it takes to actually shell acorns, you know, blend them up or, you know, pound them into a type of uh, meal or paste, what have you, and then go through that process of bleaching them and, you know, ball jars and getting out that tannic acid water, you know, pouring it out every day or twice a day and then refilling it and giving it a little taste every now and then to see if it's a, a bit more palatable, you know, and then eventually that day comes where you can taste it. And yeah, that particular, those first couple October. Octobers when I was doing that, I was just absolutely, you know, it was like my life, like after work, it would just be what I did. And, and also just the gathering aspect of it, you know, you almost kind of trade your hats throughout the year for what's in season. And it's like, okay, you know, in June, late May, June, my, my interests are solely on service berries and mulberries. And then shortly after that, it goes to the chanterelles throughout July and August. And there's just always something really on the landscape that I'm excited about that I really like to be in intentional with devoting a, a decent amount of time towards. And now that I have some older children, I have one, my first born, he's 12 now. He's been a great help in going out and 
you know, gathering different wild edibles with me. And it's become a really normal part of his life now as well, which has been rewarding in and of itself. So I definitely recommend having kids be involved with something like foraging, you know, because in some ways, truly, it's going to be more captivating and more accessible to really young children, really more than gardening does, you know, because there's this type of level of patience and uh, planning management for gardening. But uh, with foraging, it's really just this kind of innate, intuitive thing that you can kind of flick on with a child by just showing them a couple things and they can just make it their own. You know, and with the Hungry Forager, you know, we've done kids classes since the first year as well. And I, I, I wish I could uh, I could continue to keep doing more and more of them. I typically only, only do two or three a year. But those are some of the most rewarding uh, memories when I look back on, you know, all the classes that I've had or some of those child classes, because you just see these kids that grew up in, you know, a city like Louisville, like where, which is where I grew up and where I still reside. You know, you see these kids that really have maybe had some type of relationship with nature, but they're seeing it all for this first time through something like gathering, you know, fruit from a bramble or, a, a you know, a mulberry or something like that. And I just love being a part of it, you know, and it changes that relationship and interest uh, to the kids with the outdoors. And then also their parents can help, you know, continue to facilitate them to nur- uh, nurture that relationship. And it's great. That is great. I mean, that's awesome, man. Reading the book, let's come into the book here. Uh, one of the things that I just absolutely loved about it, even though the focus of the book is obviously Kentucky and, and the Southeast on, on, a, on a broader sense, I recognize many of the plants and mushrooms that you're writing about. I can find them right here where we're at in Michigan too. So I found that the book really has an appeal to folks, I think, outside of that region. I think people in a number of places are going to find this book to be incredibly valuable. Do you think that that's fair to say? No, and I appreciate you saying that. Um, And I absolutely do agree. I have friends up in Michigan as well that are, you know, foraging instructors, foraging and wild food enthusiasts and they also kind of had a part in reviewing and uh, the, the manuscript during that that process of writing and editing. And uh, they kind of said similar to you, Bevan, where it was like, you know, oh, like, you know, there's a lot of translation here. And this is exciting now because there's something new coming to our literary, you know, space. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing it. And so that was encouraging. Um, and, I, you know, and I guess one of the things, too, that you'll note in the book, a lot of the stuff, you know, when it comes to specific Kentucky things outside of the species is that when it comes to like certain natural history topics uh, at times in like the, the additional notes or maybe in some of the introduction pieces for the species, I'll kind of make it a point to talk about things that are maybe more closely tied to the southeastern region or Kentucky uh, specifically. And and that also, too, is to kind of fill a very small niche of there being a book for Kentucky that is, you know, dealing with wild edibles and also just interesting tidbits of natural history with plants that otherwise may be missed from let's just say a more like academic based botany book or dichotomous key field guide. Oh, sure. I think that some of those tidbits that you've added in these little bits of history and to me, it helps connect that sense of place that plants have, especially as a forager. So it was an enjoyable read on top of being incredibly informative. Well, thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. I wanted to, you know, in short, I really the hope with, with Foraging Kentucky is to kind of give people a sense of going to a workshop of mine. And so when it comes to some of those little tidbits and those little nuggets of uh, personal connection to a particular species or an experience with one or natural history, an ecological fact or something like that, that's kind of how I, you know, navigate workshops and classes. And so the hope was to bring the book uh, and, and make it an, an extension of a workshop that I would lead. And for those who have been in a workshop of mine and were able to read through some pieces of the book, uh, they did find it to be that way. And that's really the whole goal (laughs) with the book. So now I went through and I counted, um, there's 15 herbaceous plants, 12 mushrooms and 19 woody plants, mostly trees and shrubs. Uh, how did you dial it in to these 46 particular plants and mushrooms to write about them? Yeah. So with the, the species that I chose, I was really intentional with picking out the first, because like, for example, like with oak, like I cover two different species of oak. So it's, while it's still one genus, one concept 
it's technically two different species. And the same goes with, a, with uh, like, for example, chicken in the woods that cover two different species. So I give a couple variations of species where might be appropriate just for proper identification. Like with hickories, I cover shagbark hickory and bitternut hickory because not only do they, you know, are they different trees entirely and they have very different looks, they both produce different food crops. But as far as the actual selection, it really came down from what I personally had the the, the utmost experience and knowledge of, you know, I, I didn't want to pick out species that I've only gathered and eaten maybe three or four times. Uh, I wanted to cover species that I was really interested in, species that I had a lot of experience with over the past 12, 13 years, and also species where applicable that that were kind of more uh, more humble species in the wild food uh, literature, meaning that they don't maybe get all the love and coverage that maybe they deserve or could get. And so that that's really where it came from was just showcasing species that I thought were worthy, that were relevant to our region and to the state particularly, and then ones that I had the most experience with. But having said that, you know, I think this is just how all writers and people that get involved with a project like this, as soon as you, you know, press the submit button, so to say, and you tell all your editors, yeah, it looks good. You know, let's Let's wrap it up. You know, a month, a week goes by and you're like, oh, I wish I would have covered this species. You know, I wish I would have added this one in here, <laughs> but it, it's just how it goes. Now, aside from the obvious answer here, which is going to be go buy a copy of Forage in Kentucky. What advice do you have for novice foragers that are just looking to get started in the wide world of wild plants? Yeah, I would say probably the most underwhelming answer, which is repeated a lot, but it's it's repeated for, the, for a reason. And it would be to look at foraging uh, like a discipline of becoming an amateur botanist or an amateur mycologist in, in that learn the actual plants, be able to properly ID them just for the purpose of identifying them with confidence uh, firsthand. And then once you have that knowledge, then foraging makes sense. Then there's the option, the opportunity for foraging. And so that's why in the book and the, if the back and, you know, in the afterward, I always say this at classes and I wanted to add it in the book. There's a small little section where I, it's just, it's titled observe first, harvest second. And, uh, and that's really where that comes from, you know, learn the actual material of what it is you're interested in gathering first and l- learn it throughout, you know, maybe spend some time, a couple of weeks, if you find some chanterelles in the summertime, take a couple of them home, you know, compare them to different field guides, cross reference with other guides, look online to see if there's any forums or any other resources, videos you can find to confirm what you have is in fact a chanterelle, maybe do a spore print. And once you've, you know, had all the context clues be made and you've, and you've come to that realization that what you have or what you, you know, what you saw on that trail that day was in fact some chanterelles, then go about harvesting them and have fun with it. You know, I'm, I'm a really curious person. And when I get into interests, let's say I go really deep with them. And of course, foraging is the largest, deepest interest, passion, hobby of mine. It's really just at this point become a part of just my life because there is that sustenance side of it, where if you do it enough and you have these particular species of foods that you want to gather to eat, uh, you just kind of keep going and doing it year after year. And these traditions form, sometimes they, uh, they change because maybe you get interested about something else that you uh, learned uh, in that time period and now you have a new tradition. And so I just really encourage people to get invested with where you live and learn about the ecology of the landscapes, learn about the management of some of those more public spaces where foraging is allowed, but also be really cognizant that uh, in today's world, a lot of places are managed with herbicide. And so I would say uh, today, unfortunately, it's uh, it's just as important today to know what areas are being uh, sprayed by with herbicide as the identification of the actual plant itself in, in ways. Now, it's early spring. Uh, what are some of the foods that you're currently gathering or what's on tap for coming up next? What are you ready to, to be gathering soon? We have so many, you know, different herbaceous greens that are coming up. Um, so chickweed is the main one that I'm that I've been gathering as of the last week, two weeks now. Uh, there's some curly docks, you know, some smaller species of docks that are starting to 
uh, show up on the landscape. Violets are already out. Uh, I've already started to see some uh, red bud flowers starting to show up in some of the more full sun areas in the neighborhood that I live in. And um, yeah, it's just a lot of really interesting, fun things are starting to show back up in the landscape. And it's, it's really exciting for me just because every time, you know, spring rolls around and then those first few, you know, species of green start showing up. I know that it's just in a couple of weeks, you're going to be seeing all the red buds coming out. And then you're going to be seeing morels, you know, dryad saddle mushrooms, uh, and then soon to follow that stuff like black locust flowers. So spring is just a really busy, exciting time. It's a great time uh, to actually get into foraging as far as the spring season. I mean, it's one of the seasons where you can watch a couple plants in your own yard go through a life cycle And you can interact with them on a daily basis to kind of get familiar with them. You know, that honestly itself is is a key right there to getting into foraging for people that are new to it is to try to find what's close to you that you can access on a daily basis to, you know, to actually witness it, watch it regularly and then uh, be able to harvest it and know that it's, you know, growing in an area. Let's say if it's a plant uh, that hasn't been sprayed or isn't in an area that might be contaminated. I mean, that's like an absolute win win situation. And most of us are in that situation, but we don't know it until we actually go out and start to look. So you take the time to look around for it. Exactly. Yeah. That's awesome. George, what are the links that folks are going to need so they can learn more about your work and find their copy of Foraging Kentucky? You can go to my website, thehungryforager.com to check out any of our workshops that we offer on Instagram and Facebook. My handle is just The Hungry Forager. And when it comes to Foraging Kentucky, my book, uh, you can get that at Amazon, Barnes and Noble, really any of the online commerce stores for books, as well as hopefully your local bookstores. Fantastic. Foraging Kentucky, an introduction to the edible plants, fungi, and tree crops of the Southeast. The brand new book from George Barnett, now available everywhere the books are sold. George, thank you so much for your time today. That was awesome chatting with you. Thanks so much, Bevan. It was great talking to you. Well, here we are at the end of another show. Big thanks to George Barnett for being our guest today and to all of you for tuning in. Remember, if you want to support the show, you can always join our Patreon community. You can find that link and many more at seedsandweedspodcast.com. This episode was edited and produced by all of us here at Small House Farm. And the music we're enjoying right now is a song called A Gimme Gimme by Pineapple Music. Thanks again for joining us. I'm Bevan Cohen, and we'll see you next time. 